it's okay. Let's good evening. Bless the Lord, everybody. Yes. Just welcome to the uh, Good Friday Confirmed. We went. <laughs> But we're just going to worship together, and we're doing some familiar songs, so you can feel free to stand up and sing this with us this evening. Okay.
more time, everybody in the building, let's sing it together. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you. There's nothing. Nothing is better than you. Yes, come on, guys. wonderful name. It's a power, a name. There's nothing like the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let's begin to continue to worship our Father. Hallelujah. Yes. What a beautiful name. Amen. 
Amen, 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 amen. Keep that going. Come on, keep amen. Come on, keep it going. He's been way better than that. We're here to celebrate God. No, I'm sorry. Solid. Take it down, Barry. Relax. I don't get to see y'all a lot, so I was a little excited to see my family. Man, welcome. Welcome to Good Friday Unplugged. Okay. I thought we only had the choir up here, but clearly. Massive signups, I love it. All right, so um, my name is Barry Eggleston. I'm your director of congregational care and engagement. And we're excited to have you here at Good Friday Unplugged. So please put a, your, your hands together for yourself. First of all, if you couldn't tell, uh, we're expecting a full flight today. So unlike when you're on Southwest, if you got a seat next to you, we want you to just go ahead and scoot towards the aisle just so we can get all our, our passengers in here because we don't want them to miss what's about to happen. We prepared something really good for you, okay? That's what I'm saying, <laughs> that part. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a moment. Uh, we're going to have communion, okay? And Pastor Brent's going to come up here and lead communion. But what we want to do is make sure that we get a chance to first pray all right, and then we're gonna take some time to just solemnly reflect on just the sacrifice that God's son made for us, amen? All right, so we're gonna pray, and then what I want you to do after we pray is I want you to greet two or three people and just love on them real quick, but stay standing. If your knees are anything like mine, stay standing. All right, let's pray. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we thank you so much for another opportunity, Lord God. We thank you for a chance to come together with our family, to be able to just take a moment to reflect on the sacrifice of your son. We thank you that you're on the main line, Lord, right now. Yes, God. And we just, we, we're just in awe of you, Father. We thank you for the opportunity to also just remember that sacrifice, but to do that with our family right here on Good Friday, as we can't wait to come back on Easter Sunday to celebrate your son leaving that tomb, Father God. 
and rising. So we thank you, we praise you, and in Jesus' name we pray, all together, amen. Amen, everybody. It is so good to be here with you this evening on a Friday evening, celebrating, recognizing, remembering, reflecting on the sacrifice that Jesus made. I don't know about you, but there's just a sweetness in this space, in this room, as we open our hearts and remember the sacrifice that Jesus made on our behalf. It's a good Friday. It's a good Friday. It wasn't good for him in the moment, but it's good for us. It is a, it is a good Friday. I, I want to invite you in just a moment. We're going to take communion together as a church family. Uh, I would invite our, our communion uh, workers to come and, and take, uh, take the stations. What we're going to do in just a moment, you'll be dismissed by row, uh, and then you'll come to the various stations, and you'll be served the bread and the cup. And I would ask that you would hold on to the bread and the cup. Don't take them. Uh, and when you get back to your seat, we'll all take the elements together. This is a very solemn moment for followers of Jesus because the bread is Christ's body that was broken for us. The, the drink is Christ's blood that was poured out on our behalf. And this is a moment where we reflect on that brokenness, that sacrifice, that pouring out of himself on our behalf. So if you're a follower of Jesus, we invite you, whatever your background, tradition, uh, whatever denomination you come from, we invite you, if you're a follower of Jesus, to take communion with us. If you're someone who's not a follower of Jesus yet, you're here because you're curious about Jesus, but, but you haven't embraced his sacrifice on your behalf, we still want you to experience a moment of hospitality. So we have, uh, at all of our stations, we have little pieces of honey candy. And the honey in the candy represents the promised land. It represents the land that's flowing with milk and honey. It represents the kingdom of God into which you are invited. And so we would invite you, if you're a child and you haven't uh, been baptized, or if you're not a follower of Jesus, we still invite you to come and participate in this activity. Just take, take the candy. And for everybody else, take the bread and the cup and, and then go back to your seats and then we'll all take them together. I would invite you to come and take the elements now.
on the night that Christ was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it. And he said, take and eat. This is my body that is broken for you. And then he poured out the cup. And he said, drink. This is the blood of my covenant that is being poured out for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your sacrifice. We thank you for the body of your son that was broken, his blood that was spilled on our behalf. We thank you for the sacrifice that brought us salvation. We thank you for this opportunity to gather as your children, as the people of God, to reflect upon and to remember the pain and the suffering, the sorrow and the grief that you experienced so that we could have life. We come to reflect on the intense emotion that you felt in the garden that night when you said, if it be your will, let this cup pass from me. But then you said, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And, and you took yourself to the cross and you gave yourself for us so that we might have life. And tonight we remember that, we recognize that, we reflect on that, we meditate on that moment, on that act of gratuitous kindness and generosity, sacrificial love, and we thank you, God. We thank you for who you are. We thank you for this moment. We thank you for one another, that we get to be your body, that you are our head and we are your body, and all of us fit and join together to honor you, to serve you, and to praise you. And we love you for this. We love you for the opportunity to do this. And so, God, we just lift you up tonight. We lift up your son, Jesus. We thank you. We honor you and we praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. And somebody say, amen, amen. Turn to somebody on your way to your seat and say, thank God for the blood. Thank God for the blood. And take a seat. I knew I only had just a few moments to speak this evening, but I prepared a two-hour sermon. <laughs> but it, by the Lord's will, I'm going to do it in about 12 minutes. Amen, somebody. You said amen a little too excitedly on that. That wasn't right. Um, I, would, I would like to invite our greeters to come forward. Uh, our greeters are going to hand out some three-by-three three index cards. Uh, little cards for you. I would ask that you hold on to those cards. If our greeters, if someone could have our greeters come forward, um, they're going to hand these out and there's going to be some little three by three cards that we would invite you to, to hold on to because you're going to need them in just a few moments. You're going to need these cards in just a few moments. Um, I, I'm going to speak for just a few moments on the topic, uh, on the topic that I'm calling today, the great cover up. The great cover-up. Several years ago, when my wife Rebecca and I purchased our home in University City, we were excited about getting this new home. We were moving in. We were bringing in our boxes and, and, and getting settled in. And I noticed on the wall, uh, uh, I, I noticed on the wall that there was a little black smudge on the wall uh, of the house. And I, I didn't pay any attention to it. I thought maybe a mover had bumped into it or whatever and maybe just made a little schmear right there or whatever. So I didn't, I didn't, I didn't think anything about it. About a day or two later, uh, I noticed that the, the little black mark, the smudge, had grown a little bit. It, it was just, it was small, but then it looked a little bit bigger. I thought, huh, that's weird, but I didn't really think that much about it. Two or three days later, I, I, I looked over at the wall again and I noticed that that black mark had gotten to be about, about this big. And I said, well, what in the world is going on around here? So I went over to the black mark to inspect it. And I, and I put my finger on it. And my finger went right through the drywall. 
went right through the drywall. It, the drywall was soft and moist. And what had happened was that a prior owner, who shall remain unnamed because this is a night of grace, and <laughs> a prior owner had noticed a defect in the brick wall where moisture was coming in through the wall. And it would have been very expensive to, to repair that wall. And so the prior owner just covered up the defect. And that, of course, caused moisture and mold to seep into, into the wall because there, there had just been a cover-up. Now, I wanted to get on my high horse. I wanted to be judgmental. I wanted to be able to look down on this prior owner. But then I remembered that, in fact, I had done something similar some years prior. Not as bad. Not as bad, but something like that. I, I, had, I had rented an apartment, and um, when I left the apartment, I took all my pictures off the wall, and everywhere that, where there was a picture, there was a little hole. There was a defect in the wall. Now, I could have gone down to Home Depot and got the putty knife and the, and the spatula and the sandpaper, and I could have repaired it the right way, but I said, you know what, let me just, let me just get some toothpaste, and, and I, just covered up, I just covered up the holes. It was a cover-up. Now, some of you may be sitting there ready to judge me, but I would, I would challenge you, I would challenge you tonight on this, on this point. All of us knows what it's like to cover up a mistake, to cover up a failure, to cover up a, a character defect. We all know what it's like to sin. The Bible says all have sinned and, and fallen short of the glory of God. We've all We've all failed in some way or another. We've all made mistakes. And all of us have been tempted at some point or the other to cover up our mistake rather than to expose it to cover it up. Now, if you're here tonight and you're saying, I've never done that, well, then you're doing it right now. You're just covering up. <laughs> you're covering up your sin. The reality is this, this propensity, this inclination to cover up our failures is universal it's in every culture, it's in every tribe, it's in every millennia throughout time. It actually is documented in the very first book of the Bible with the very first couple related to the very first sin. There was a couple that God had created and, and he made them and he put them in a paradise, in a garden, a beautiful garden where they had everything that they could have possibly wanted. Not just what they needed, but everything that they wanted. And in his gratuitous love and kindness, he said, you can have everything. I want, I want you to know everything is yours for the taking, except for one thing. There's, there's one prohibition. I don't want you to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And, and he didn't want them to eat from that tree because, because if you eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, then you start to think that you're a God and you start to think that you can determine what's right and wrong and you can decide what's right and what's wrong. And he knew that if the people ate from that tree, there would be violence and there would be chaos and there would be oppression and there would be harm and there would be shame and there would be fear and all of this devastation would enter into the world. So he said, don't eat of that tree. But what do we do when there's one thing we can't do? Well, they, they, got, they got tempted. Their, their curiosity got the better of them. And they went and they ate from the tree. And immediately when they ate from the tree, they knew. They knew that they had sinned. And instead of exposing their sin to God, they covered it up. They hid. In fact, in the book of Genesis where it describes the moment that they ate from the tree, it says this, Genesis 3, 7, it says, then the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and they made what? They made coverings for themselves. They hid because they were afraid of the wrath of God. They were afraid of the judgment of God. They knew they had sinned and so they just covered it up. They just covered it up. So when the Lord came and said, hey, Adam, where are you? Where are you? Adam said, I, we heard you in the garden and we were afraid because we were naked, and so we hid. By naked, he means we were exposed. We were vulnerable. We were ashamed, and so we hid. We concealed ourselves. Now, this is the moment where we get to see God's character because God had given them everything, and there was just one thing they couldn't do, and they did the one thing they weren't supposed to do. And God could have said, I'm, in, in his rage, he could have just destroyed them, said, it's not worth it. But his character comes out so beautifully in this moment 
Because seeing that they couldn't cover their shame, he covered it for them. Genesis 3, 21, just a a few verses down. It says, the Lord God made clothing out of the skins for Adam and his wife, and he clothed them. They couldn't clothe themselves. They couldn't cover themselves, and so he clothed them. But I want you to notice how he clothed them. God sacrificed the life of the innocent to cover the sin of the guilty. The skin came from an animal that had done no wrong. And there, there was bloodshed for the first time on the earth. There was sacrifice for the first time on the earth. And God was trying to teach them and trying to teach us something profound, a deeply profound insight about life. And the insight is simply this. Sa- salvation requires sacrifice. You get no salvation unless there's sacrifice. The blood of the innocent was shed for the guilty. Now you fast forward a few hundred years and the Israelite children, the, the, the sons and daughters of, of, of Adam and Eve and, and their great, great, great grand, grandchildren ended up in bondage in, in Egypt. And they were enslaved by Pharaoh. They were enslaved by the Egyptian slave masters. And they needed desperately to get out of this situation. They were bound. And God sent Moses to Pharaoh to say, tell Pharaoh to let my people go. And Moses went and Pharaoh said, I'm not going to let your people go. And so God began to send plagues. And the final plague was the slaughter of the firstborn. And God said, I'm going to send the angel of death and I'm I'm going to take out the firstborn. But I can cover you with blood. What I need you to do is I need you to find an animal a perfect sheep, a perfect little lamb with no spot or blemish and and kill it and put the blood of that lamb on the doorpost of your home. That will be your covering. And when the angel of death comes, those of you who have covered it with blood, you will be saved. That will be your covering. And, And this is what God said to Moses. He said, the blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over. Once again, he's saying something profound, something deep, something important for us to understand. And that is salvation requires sacrifice. The sacrifice of the innocent for the guilt, for the guilt of those who are guilty. Once again, God covers us with blood. The, the, the Israelite children are then freed and, and, and they're in the land flowing with milk and honey and life is good. But they left external bondage and they went into internal bondage because they began to fall back prey to sin and temptation. They began to eat from the fruits again that they they were not allowed to eat from. And so they ended up being bound by their own sin, by their own decisions, by their own uh, habits. And God once again said, I I can't, I've got to, I've got to cover this sin. And so he instituted the practice of the death of a, of a, of a sheep, of, of a lamb every year the blood of the lamb, to cover the sins. He he said this in Leviticus 17. He said, For the life of a creature is in the blood, and I have given it to you to make atonement for yourselves on the altar. It is the blood that makes atonement for one's life. That word atonement is from a Hebrew word, kafar. Kafar means to cover over. It means to cover over. In other words, once again, the innocent, The sacrifice of the innocent is for the guilt of the guilty. Once again, God is teaching this profound lesson that salvation requires sacrifice. 400 years later, God sends a prophet. A prophet who says something different, who says something new, who says something unique, who takes what God has said and and expands on it. it. It progresses it. Isaiah comes and he says, Yes, the lamb is needed. The lamb is needed for you to be forgiven. But God is going to send a lamb and that lamb is going to be a man. It's going to be the lamb of God, but it's going to be a man. And then he said something really profound. He said, when this lamb of God comes, he won't just cover your sins. He will carry your sins. He won't just cover them over. He'll bear them upon himself and he'll carry them away. So you won't just have sins that are covered. You'll have sins that are forgotten. 
you'll have sins that are washed away. Let, let, me, let me read you what Isaiah said. I want you to listen closely. Now, this was written hundreds of years before Jesus, but he wrote it in a way that, that looks almost like it looks back at the Messiah. It says this, For he had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind. He was a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised and we held him in low esteem. Now look at this. Surely, he said, he took up our pain. He's starting to carry stuff. He took up our pain and he bore our sufferings. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was bruised. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. He said, we all like sheep have gone astray. Each one of us have turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He's saying he's not just going to cover your sins, he's going to carry your sins. The iniquity of us all is laid on him. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. After he suffered, he will see the light of life, and he will be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. For he bore the sin of many and he made intercession for the wrongdoers. This lamb that will be a man is not gonna just cover your sins. He's gonna carry them away. He's going to carry them away. Finally, the day came, 33 AD. It was Passover. It was the time of the slaughtering of the lamb for the forgiveness of sins. Jesus comes riding into Jerusalem. He knows what's about to happen. He told his disciples, this is about to go down. On Thursday night, he was arrested in the garden. On Friday, he was beaten. He, he, he was slapped. He was spit upon. He was mocked. And, and he was taken to a hill they called Golgotha, which means the skull. And in the final affront, to his dignity, they stripped off his clothing and they took nails and they pierced his, his hands, his, his hands and his feet. And they, and they nailed him on a cross, Roman crucifixion, and they lifted him up for everyone to see. This is your lamb of God. This is your king. This is your savior. And as the blood was pouring down from his body, it was pouring down from his brow and pouring down from his back. And as the Lamb of God was carrying your sin and mine, he looked out across the crowd at his supporters and his detractors, those who followed him and those who rejected him. And he took a deep breath and he said, Father, forgive them. Forgive them, for they know not what they do. He said, I'm going to take your sin upon me and I'm going to give you my righteousness. One of his closest followers after this happened reflected back on the moment and this is how he described it. In, in Peter uh, 2.24, he said this, he himself bore our sins, carried our sins in his body on the tree so that having died to sins, we might live for righteousness. Final act. The final moment, the final time, God once again teaches us that salvation requires sacrifice. There's an old song that we were singing just not long ago. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is that flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know nothing but the blood of Jesus. Today, I want to I close with a question. I want to close with a question. The question is this. What are you trying to cover that you need Jesus to carry? What are you trying to cover in your life that you need Jesus to take upon the cross? What shame, 
what fear, what regret, what condemnation, what failure, what sin, what are you trying to cover? We've all been there. We've all done it. What are you trying to cover that you need Jesus to carry? What do you need to unburden yourself of today? What do you need to lay at the foot of the cross? What do you need to give to Jesus? Because he won't just cover it. He'll carry it away. He sacrificed himself for you. So what I'm going to invite us to do as we, as we close this portion of the service, what, what I want to invite you to do is I want you to take a moment and just in your own private time, just alone, I want you to pray and, and, and meditate and ask God, what is it that I need to lay at the foot of your cross? What sin, what shame, what regret, what fear, what past action, what unkind word, what, what deed have I done? Where's the defect that I've tried to cover in my life that I just need you to carry? I just need you to take it away. So I would ask that in the next few moments, you just reflect on that. And if somebody would bring me one of those papers, if you would just reflect on that and you can take this paper and just grab me a pen. And if you would just write down what that is, you don't need to show anybody what it is. You just write it down for yourself, fold the paper in half, and then at your own time, you can come forward and we'll have a team up here. We've got, we've got cross beams here, we've got nails, and we've got hammers, and we would just invite you to come and nail that thing. Whatever it is you need that you've been trying to cover, you need Jesus to carry, you just nail it to the cross. I'll go first. Strength like no other, strength like no other, it reaches to me, yes, you are my Strength like no other, strength like no other, it reaches to me, come on and sing, you are my strength, you are my strength, strength like no other, strength like no other. Strength like no other, no other, and it reaches to me. Come on, sing. You are, you are my strength. Strength like no other, no other. Strength like no other. One more time, come on and sing. You are my strength, you are my strength. Strength like no other, no other. Strength, strength like no other. And it reaches to me. Come on, let's sing in the fullness. In the fullness, sing it out. In the fullness of your grace. In the power of your name. In the power of your name. You lift me up. You lift me up. Yeah. You lift me up. You lift me up. One more time, sing. In the power of your name, you lift me up above every fear, above every sin. You lift me up, you lift, you lift me up. 
Come on and sing, you are my strength. You are my strength. Strength like no other. Father, strength like no other. No other. And it reaches out to me. One more time, sing it again. No other strength like no other. Yes, and it reaches out to me. Come on, let's sing in the fullness, in the fullness, in the fullness, and in the power of your name. And in the power of your name, power of you lift me up by your stripes. So tonight we are healed. You lift me up. You lift. Come on, sing that out in the fullness. Sing it out in the fullness. In the fullness. And in the power. sing it out.
much it costs to see my sin upon that I'll never know how much it costs to see my sin upon that cross. One more time, sing it out. I'll never know how much it costs just to see my sin up on the cross. I'll never know how much to see my sin upon the cross. So he
gospel. This is the good news. Tell everybody how he loves you. This is the gospel. I'm in the good news. Tell everybody there's a God that loves you. Oh, how he loves you. Oh, God that loves you. Oh, how he loves you. There's a God that loves you. Then came the Savior, was born in a manger, raised up in ransom us. Healing the blind, raising dead back to life, all the signs of his perfect love. And there on the cross, how he paid every cost, he defeated death, hell, and grave. And on that third morning, the stone started rolling. Oh, what a beautiful day. This is the gospel. This is the good news. Tell everybody how he saved you. This is the gospel. Come hear the good news. Tell everybody there's a God that loves you. Oh, how he loves you. There's a God that loves you. Oh, how he loves you. There's a God that loves you.
should give yourself a round of applause for that. I really, I really want to just, just cut loose and celebrate. But we don't do that until Sunday, y'all. <laughs> Easter Sunday morning, bring a friend. Let's celebrate the risen Savior. We, we celebrate his sacrifice. We celebrate his death. We celebrate his burial when he went to the tomb. But Sunday morning, we're going to say. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. And may his face shine upon you. May he be gracious to you. And may he turn his face toward you. May he give you peace. God bless you. We'll see you Sunday.